especially of optimization, maybe we have to thank Stephen for that. And I think he's managed to strike a nice balance between theory and practice in addition to stay here, he has had a couple of industrial internships at Autodesk and Oculus. And after he completed his PhD, he managed to join up. Now, beyond the technical things, the Grenzi has been a real strong social force in my group always helping others and organizing social events. And has done this much more so actually outside the group, especially in the context of the Spark of Indian students, which have many here, as president of the Spark of India Association, the Spark of Indian Students Association, and have established the Spark of Indian Faith Council. It's also been helping high school students, particularly in the Beyond that, uh, he's cricket. <laughs> 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 yeah, that makes him unique among the students I've had. I think also among all the students that I've had, he has the longest full name. <laughs> 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 I think he also managed to assemble the largest audience for me ever. <laughs> so today, he will show us about geometric and structural inference on shape collections. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Professor. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Vignesh Karanthi Subramanian, and I am a student in the Geometry Lab, advised by Professor Leo Gibas. I thank you all for being here at my defense talk titled Geometric and Structural Inference on Shape Collections. The space of visual data is exploding drastically today, thanks to the ubiquitous <laughs> presence of cameras. An example of this is Google Images which has close to a trillion images. ImageNet has close to a billion images, many of which are annotated. The fact that these are annotated makes it a handy data set to perform inference on unseen images. A natural extension of ImageNet to the 3D world is ShapeNet, the world's largest academic repository of 3D shapes. ShapeNet, which was developed by members of our lab, alongside other researchers at Stanford, Princeton, and TTI, is a rich repository of 3D shapes with multiple categories and annotations of different kinds. <coughs> Thanks to the easy portability of cameras and scanning technologies today, it has become very easy to capture scenes such as this. Now, as all of you might be able to figure out, this is something that belongs to a laboratory setup. You can see objects over here that you can identify with. You can see tables, chairs, monitors, whiteboards and whatnot. So a lot of incomplete images over here incomplete shapes, which could be completed if there was some inference which was performed on them. There's also a lot of relationships between these various shapes that you can read out of this sort of a scan. <coughs> we should talk a little bit more about those problems over the course of this talk, but given a scan of an object, this scan can be represented in one of multiple 3D representational formats. For example, a point cloud. A point cloud is a set of 3D points that represents a particular, particular object. Another such representation is the mesh. A mesh is an embedding in embedded graph in 3D with vertices and faces. But whatever be the representation, when we say we want to relate a couple of objects, what we intend to relate are the underlying objects and not really the representations. So say I have an African elephant and an Indian elephant. If I want to relate these two guys, what I want to relate is the elephantness between them. That's what I want to capture. And how do I go about capturing this? There are multiple similarity perspectives by means of which one can analyze these pairs of images uh, or shapes. One is the geometry. So both these shapes have a trunk with tusks flanking it on both sides. So you can use a common geometry to relate them. Both of these shapes have a torso with four <coughs> legs and an elongated head unit. So what you could do is use the commonness of the structure to relate them. Now, this is not something that is just common to these two elephants. It's something that's common to almost all four-legged animals. Also, if we knew which part of this animal was what, we could use the actual semantic understanding to relate these two shapes. So there are many such similarity perspectives. And over the course of my thesis, and over the course of this talk, I shall talk about how we can use two specific similarity perspectives to understand shape relationships, specifically geometry and structure. So when I say geometry, 
what we intend to do is relate shapes by means of some low level intrinsic local geometry based information. And when we say structural similarity of shapes, we intend to relate them on a more global scale using some commonality such as template based commonality or topological commonality between the two shapes. For each of these cases, we intend to motivate it by means of a real world application that we try to solve. In the case of geometry, we try to solve the problem of shape matching, while in the case of structure, we try to solve the problem of shape completion. Shape matching is the technique by means of which you can register parts of one shape to parts of another shape. Now these parts could be points on the surface of the two shapes or regions on the surface of the two shapes. So when we say we want to use geometric similarity of shapes to match them, geometric similarity tells us something about the explicit similarity between the two different shapes, therefore you can use it to actually match those two shapes. Shape completion is the problem by means of which you complete an incomplete or partial point cloud or scan. So this could be done in multiple ways. If you have a partial point cloud, you could densify this point cloud to hallucinate the parts of the shape that are missing. If you had a scan, you could replace it with one connected object that would kind of predict how the complete shape would have looked. Or given a partial scan, you can retrieve an object from a known database of shapes and say, hey, this is how the shape would have looked if it was complete. So first we shall talk about how one can use geometric similarity to do shape inference and solve the problem of shape matching using that. So when we say geometric similarity of shapes, what we intend to capture is similarity based on geometric descriptors. Now there are many known geometric descriptors, some of these are really popular such as PCA. But anything is ultimately a good geometric descriptor as long as it consistently captures certain geometric properties of the shapes. In this work when I talk about geometric descriptors, I shall refer to per point descriptors. So these descriptors shall contain a value for every point on the surface of the shape. This value tells you something about the local geometry of the shape. One descriptor that we shall see over and over again over the course of this talk is a heat kernel signature. A heat kernel signature is a descriptor that captures how well heat from a unit heat source placed somewhere on the surface of a shape dissipates across the rest of the shape. This is uh, obtained by solving the Laplace heat equation and is incredibly a very good geometric descriptor for the shape. Another such descriptor which can be obtained by solving the Schrodinger's wave equation instead of the Laplace heat equation is the wave kernel signature. This is also a very good geometric descriptor for the shape. So in this work, when I say we have these shapes, we assume that these descriptors are pre-computed on these shapes and you can use these descriptors directly to relate these two shapes. So once you have these descriptors on the shapes, you can use these descriptors to perform feature alignment and therefore shape matching between these shapes. This kind of techniques have already been used well in existing literature to solve the problem for isometric or near isometric shapes. Now what are isometric shapes? So given a pair of shapes, if I tell you that they are isometric to each other, that means given a pair of points on the first shape and a corresponding pair of points on the second shape across this isometry map, the distance between the first pair of points along the surface of the first shape and the distance between the corresponding pair of points along the surface of the second shape should be identical or near the same. For example, in this case, the red points correspond to the left ear lobe of the three cats and the blue points correspond to the left paw of the three cats. The distance between the red point and the blue point along the surface of the three shapes is almost the same and hence these are near isometric shapes. Now why are isometric shapes important? They are critical in defining what is known as intrinsic similarity of two different shapes. Now two different shapes are said to be intrinsically similar to one another as long as they are separated by at most an isometry. This means the local geometry of the two shapes would be identical. For example in this uh, left shape and the middle shape you would see that the local geometry is identical in spite of the fact that there are certain fingers which are bent in different ways. Now in the, in, in the more global sense if we had now, we didn't have intrinsic similarity between two different shapes, but we had a more global similarity such as a rigid transformation or a scaling, these shapes are said to be extrinsically similar. For example, in the rightmost shape, this, uh, the, the two fingers are touching each other thereby disturbing the local geometry. Therefore, these are extrinsically similar and not intrinsically similar. Now, why are intrinsically similar shapes important? Because most of the descriptors we speak about, the HKS or the heat kernel signature or the WKS are intrinsic descriptors and are invariant to isometric deformations. Therefore, matching isometric shapes could be done by plainly matching values along these intrinsic descriptors. So, 
to do this, there is this very interesting work called Functional Map Play of Janikov et al, which was proposed in 2012. They tried to do the same, uh, same matching for isometric shapes using intrinsic descriptors. And here they treat descriptors as functions on the shape space corresponding to a particular shape. So here, matching descriptors on one shape to descriptors on the other shape becomes equivalent to matching functions on the shape space of the first shape to functions on the shape space of the second shape. And this was shown to be a linear map in the case of having point-to-point -point correspondences. Therefore, it was really very easy to compute. In the first work of the thesis, I shall talk about learning, uh, obtaining correspondences on non-isometric or very different shape pairs. Here, we shall still use ideas from the functional map setup, but shall extend this to non-isometric or extremely different shapes. So isometries are rather restrictive. In the more general case of mapping non-isometric shapes, people typically use conformal or angle preserving maps as opposed to isometric or distance preserving maps. So this handles moderate variations or moderate deformations of the shape, but typically it fails in the case of extreme deformations. So the drawbacks of existing works are that they, these maps and these techniques fail in the case of extreme deformations, and even in the case of moderate deformations, most of these techniques have multiple solutions. Therefore, these solutions are not reproducible all the time. So we would like to propose a technique by means of which we obtain robust stable correspondences on these non-isometric shapes. To this end, we use a rank-based descriptor as opposed to value-based descriptors as typically used to obtain isometric correspondences. And for this, we propose a novel biclustering technique to obtain the regions in correspondence across the two different shapes. This technique is something that can be used even beyond the scope of just shape matching. So these are two non-isometric shapes, a cat and a dog, with a heat kernel signature overlaid on top of it. <coughs> now, obviously we cannot match them value to value because they are non-isometric shapes with intrinsic descriptors on top of them. But what we can observe is that the value corresponding to the high, the point corresponding to the highest value on both the shapes is the tail. The point corresponding to the lowest value is the eye. And we could we could somehow look at the ranks, and the ranks would probably be in correspondence. We can we can try to extend this. So what we try to do is we play a simple experiment. We push all these points uh, on these two shapes to the real line, and bin these two mapped lines equal. Now we transport uh, these to a common pool and transport this information back to the shape, and we observe that this seems to make some sense for this descriptor. The bins in the two uh, two shapes seem to be matching well as long as these two shapes have a uniform distribution of vertices. This is something that has been computed on just one descriptor, right? So you have an affinity matrix corresponding to this one descriptor. Now this affinity matrix is a matrix of size, number of points on the surface of the second shape by the number of points on the surface of the first shape, where every entry has a value 1 if a point corresponding to the second shape and a corresponding point in the first shape were bin together, else you have a value 0. <laughs> now this has been done on one descriptor and therefore yeah. you can accumulate this over multiple descriptors to get rid of the noise. So what we do is we just add this over multiple descriptors and now we observe that every entry corresponds to the number of descriptors where a certain point in the first shape and a corresponding point in the second shape were bent together. Now we show in this paper that as long as we have enough good descriptors, we shall be able to obtain an affinity matrix that obtains the shape similarities well enough. We shall not get into the details of this proof because of, uh, because of lack of time. But once we have this affinity matrix, we should like to obtain regions of correspondence between these two shapes from this affinity matrix. So how we do this is by proposing this idea called the truncated power iteration technique. So the power iteration technique, as many of you might be knowing, is the technique that is useful to obtain the highest uh, the eigenvector corresponding to the highest eigenvalue of a matrix. Here what we do is something very similar. We take a descriptor on the first shape and transport it to the second shape by means of the affinity matrix. And then we transport it back to the first shape. We keep doing this till we hit a fixed point. But we do this with a small variation. When we transport it from the first uh, shape to the second shape, we obtain a soft descriptor on the second shape. We truncate or threshold on the second shape. There are two reasons we do this. The first reason is that when we transport the descriptor to the second shape, we have a soft descriptor and we'd like to focus all our attention on the regions of highest affinity. The second reason we do this truncation is because at the end of this fixed point search, we'd like to obtain a pair of regions on the two shapes. And this gives us a pair of regions. So when we go about this process, we obtain a pair of regions on the two shapes. And these two regions are the regions of highest affinity. 
we discard these regions and we continue performing this on the next on the remainder of the shape obtaining the regions of next highest affinity and so on at the end of the process we obtain something such as this where you have two different shapes and you have regions on the first shape and corresponding regions on the second shape we also show these correspondences on the case, in the case of the airplane and the bird and the octopus and the ant the case of the octopus and the ant as you can see these are very different shapes but because they have a common geometry this geometric descriptor captures these similarities well enough we also showcase this in the case of very extreme examples such as dog and a human again you see that uh, because the geometric <coughs> descriptor captures the extremities well enough and the extremities for both these shapes are the limbs of the two shapes and these, uh, these descriptors also capture the interiors well enough which are basically the torso and the human uh, and the face you can relate these two shapes well enough we also compare our technique to the classical uh, non-isometric shape matching technique the blended intrinsic maps here we show that the percentage of correct correspondences we obtained uh, for various categories as opposed to blended intrinsic maps uh, is better we also show this in a qualitative manner where uh, we have a set of regions on the first shape and then we transport it to the second shape by means of our technique and we also transport it to the second shape by means of blended intrinsic maps and we obtain better correspondences than blended intrinsic maps to summarize our contributions in this work we propose and provide robust stable correspondences on non-isometric shapes here we do this by means of rank based descriptors as opposed to the classical value based descriptors to relate these shapes Finally, we provide a, non, uh, a novel biclustering technique which obtains region correspondences between the two different shapes. Uh, this is something that can be useful even beyond the scope of just shape matching. The major limitations of this work are that we don't obtain any control on the regions of correspondence that we have. Also, this uniform distribution of vertices on the two shapes is very, very important. We would never be able to map shapes such as this because one of them has a disproportionately big head. Finally, uh, because we use intrinsic descriptors, our technique is oblivious to intrinsic symmetries. Therefore, we would never be able to disambiguate, say, the left part of a shape from the right part of our shape, as long as these shapes are symmetric. Now, we have these maps on a pair of shapes. But if you want to extend this to an entire collection of shapes, this comes with its own sets of, sets of challenges. The first challenge is that of cyclic consistency. So what is cyclic consistency? Given a descriptor on one shape, if I have a collection of shapes and I want to transport this descriptor across a loop of shapes, say from shape 1 to shape 2 to shape 3, back to shape 1, I would ideally like for the descriptor to not change in this transportation across the loop. So this is called cyclic consistency. The other challenge over here is that if I need a cyclic consistent setup, then I would first need to build maps between all pairs of shapes. Now, given a huge collection of shapes, building maps between all pairs of shapes increases quadratically as a number as the number of shapes and this can be extremely time consuming so may, so building in some sense a modular setup would help us we would be able to parallelize this and thereby build these uh, these connections very easily so to do so to solve these two challenges we propose modular and consistent latent spaces over a collection of shapes and try to extend this to an entire collection so there are two key ideas to be preserved over here consistency and modularity Consistency, as I already told you, is something that makes information transfer meaningful. Also, if I had a consistent setup, and I had a map from shape 1 to shape 2, and a map from shape 2 to shape 3, then the map from shape 1 to shape 3 would just be the composition of these two maps. Therefore, I would have transport functions also double up as maps. Consistency as a means to obtain correspondences has already been well studied in the case of images and key points. The more recent work of CycleGAN tries to use cyclic consistency as a means to obtain mappings between untrained sets of images. Consistency is basically something that gives you an additional layer of understanding or meaning to shape and image relationships. <coughs> the other property to be preserved over here is modularity. Modularity is the separation of tasks such that different parts of a program or the different modules perform these tasks in parallel. Now what does modularity buy us? Modularity firstly makes information transfer easy. Also, if I had a shape processing unit that was modular, then I can process every shape in parallel and thereby just connect these to the shape grid. Therefore, it makes it easily extendable to an entire collection of shapes. So this is a classical setup where we would have a number of shapes and we would have maps between all pairs of shapes. Now, once a new shape is seen, you would need to build maps between the new shape and all these existing shapes. This is extreme overhead of information, information transport. 
So the drawbacks of the existing works are that you first need to build maps between all pairs of shapes. Also typically these maps are either simple and non-expressive but linear and easy to transport or extremely complex, computationally intensive but not that easy to transport. So here we propose consistent maps over a non-isometric shape collection. Here we solve uh, this, this problem by means of introducing the concept of modularity for the first time in the context of shape map computation. To do this, we build high quality embedding spaces based on simply the descriptors of every single shape, thereby making this parallelizable over all the shapes. So for this, we take inspiration from the old telephone operators. So in olden days, if A needed to speak to B, A would contact the telephone operator and ask the telephone operator to put him in touch with B. So all A would need to do is to tell the telephone operator that he wants to speak to this guy, B. And all the telephone operator would need to know is who are the two guys I need to connect. So he would need to connect A and B to each other. In similar way, if we have a high dimensional descriptor on the shape space of a first shape, and we want to transport this to the high dimensional descriptor space of the second shape, this is time consuming and is cumbersome. Instead, if there was some way by means of which I can build an embedding space from this high dimensional descriptor space of that shape to a corresponding low dimensional embedding space, then all I need to do is have these embedding spaces talk to each other. The heavy work, function processing, the map, the, the basically the difficult part of the process is the non-linearity over here, which is done in parallel across all these shapes. So to build this non-linear embedding, what we do is we view the relative distribution of descriptors in this high dimensional space. So we have a bunch of gorilla descriptors over here and what we do is in this high dimensional space we try to see how is every descriptor different from every other descriptor. And we use this relative information to build this non-linear embedding space. And once you have this non-linear embedding space, you can make a, you can make, you make low dimensional embedding space. And once you have this low dimensional embedding space, you can make these embedding spaces talk to each other by means of simple linear maps through an intermediate latent shape space or your telephone operator. So your telephone operator just connects these embedding spaces to one another and this transport is made very easy. So in this setup, once you have a set of shapes and all of them are connected to the latent shape space, given a new shape, you just need to build the embedding space of this latent shape space, uh, of this new shape and connect that also to the latent shape space. This makes our technique truly modular since every shape can be processed in parallel and just added to the shape grid. Now this is not only modular but also consistent. This is because, say I have a descriptor on the first shape and I want to transport it to the second shape. So from the horse to the wolf, what would I do? I would first embed the horse descriptor into the latent shape space and then de-embed it into the wolf shape space. Now when I do it across a loop of shapes, I have a series of embedding de-embedding operations. And as long as this embedding de-embedding operation, uh, they compose to identity, this technique is also consistent. Therefore you have a modular and consistent map this way. We show results of cyclic consistency over a series of, uh, over a loop of shapes across different categories. You see over here that common parts of all these shapes are highlighted together. Now this is because, this is not something that we enforce, this is because cyclic consistency is in play. Also, you can see that uh, the way you understand these maps is that points which are of similar color are to be mapped to each other. So basically red points map to red points and the white points map to white points and so on. We also use this technique to perform descriptor transport. We consider an input descriptor, in this particular case a WKS descriptor on the cat and we transport it to the dog. And we observe that the WKS descriptor transported to the dog is almost as good as the ground truth WKS descriptor generated on the dog. We do the same thing transporting an HKS descriptor from a man to a woman. We also perform descriptor transport on a number of other uh, categories such as airplanes, fishes and vases. In the case of vases, this is particularly interesting because of the fact that e each of these vases has a different number of handles. But because of the fact that the geometry is common across all of these shapes, you see that this transport happens in a consistent manner. We also use this technique to transport uh, parts from one shape to parts on another shape. Uh, here again you see that the number of slats on the two chairs are different, or the number of tentacles on the octopi are different, but they still match uh, in a corresponding manner. We also use our technique to compare against other functional map based descriptor transport techniques and we outperform um, all of these other techniques but it is to be remembered over here that we use a linear non-linear setup while most of these techniques have a direct linear map and therefore we do have a slight advantage over there. We also compare our technique to Huang et al. Huang et al is the only other technique that tries to build maps 
from a, uh, tries to build a consistent set of maps in a network of shapes. Um, you can see over here that our uh, technique outperforms Wang et al. significantly, and for tw even for 20 shapes, Wang et al. the time taken um, explodes. This is because of the fact that we use modularity, while modularity was not used previously. To summarize our contributions of this work, we have provided consistent maps over a non-isometric shape collection. Here we have introduced the concept of modularity for the first time in the context of map computation. And we do this by introducing high quality embedding spaces which are built solely based on the shape descriptors and the differences between these descriptors on the shape, <coughs> thereby making this parallelizable over a shape. <coughs> the limitations of this work are that we have a collection of shapes and this, these maps they capture the commonalities between the shapes in the collection really, really well. But they don't really capture the differences between the shapes that well. Also, <coughs> the embedding, embedding space that we build is, it, this treats all the descriptors the same. So we do not really consider which descriptors are noisy, which descriptors are actually good. It would help to actually learn these descriptor weights based on feature importance. So we've shown that we can use geometry based shape inference to solve the important problem of shape matching and we can pass an entire collection using this, uh, this, this kind of inference. On the second part of the talk, we shall use structural similarity based shape inference to pass a collection and use this to complete uh, incomplete point clouds or scans. So there are many works that attempt to use structure as a proxy for the actual shape. Uh, one such example is Karagaragis et al, where they try to use various components and mix and match them to generate new shapes in a probabilistic manner. Another work is Grass, where they move along a structure aware latent space and try to synthesize new shapes. Now it is to be remembered that while in the first part of our talk we used unstructured latent spaces, in the structure aware part of the talk we shall use structure aware variables thanks to the fact that we are actually trying to capture structural similarity over there. So in this way we shall try to um, obtain structure transfer from complete shapes to partial shapes by means of structure aware shape templates. This is the third work of the thesis. Here we shall use these complete templates to transfer structure to partial scans and complete them. There are plenty of works which have attempted to use um, shape templates or primitives to represent shapes in the past. One such work is Tulsiani et al, where shapes are abstracted by means of box primitives and these are used to obtain a structural assembly of the shapes. Sung et al is one of the earliest works that tries to complete partial shapes by transferring structure from complete shapes. Another such work is Dai et al, which tra tries to transfer structure from shapes in a database to complete partial shapes. The drawbacks of these works though is that most of these reconstruction works, they provide output in the form of voxel grids or point clouds. While for shape modeling purposes, typically you would like to have output in the form of CAD models or meshes. Also, existing works that have shape primitives such as Tulsiani et al, which I showed in the last slide, uh, they typically have no relationship between the various primitives in the particular shape. So if I have a set of boxes representing a chair, I don't have any relationship between these boxes. So to handle these issues, we propose structure aware shape templates which are equipped with meta information. This meta information contains structure that can be useful to transfer this from complete templates to partial scans. We also perform shape completion by a retrieval and deformation based completion pipeline to complete these partial shapes, scenes and also perform label propagation and shape synthesis. So now given a database of shapes, there is a lot of commonality in these shapes. The tables in this room have a flat, uh, flat surface, they all have like two legs, chairs in a collection of chairs have, uh, there are many chairs with four legs, there are many chairs with swivels and there is so much shared structure that can be exploited over here. These exploited structures, the under, underlying structures can be useful to perform scan completion or label propagation. These can also be useful to generate new shapes which are helpful for performing data augmentation and learning models. So in this work, when I say shape templates, Shape templates would typically mean box primitives connected by means of a metagram. So basically, every shape template would be defined by a graph. This graph has nodes which are the boxes and edges which are connectors which connect any two of these boxes. There are multiple pieces of information that are embedded in the metagram. One such information would be the relative positioning of these boxes. So if I have say a seat box and a leg box, the leg box would always be below the seat box. Also, the other piece of information in the metagrammer is symmetries. So if I have a four-legged chair template, then the four legs are said to be symmetric about each other and therefore the boxes would share parameters. 
So the idea over here is to fit these templates to the underlying shapes so as to obtain information about these shapes from the templates. Here you see that these various templates are axis aligned. This is because it makes inference and optimization easier. So this is the setup you have. You have a shape input in the form of a point cloud or a shape mesh. You have a template input which is a skeleton structure. In this case a four-legged chair template. And the output is the template which has been fit to the input point cloud or the shape mesh. Here this is a very non, high, non, highly non-convex optimization, uh, the details of which we shall not get into over the course of the talk. But for this we use the CMAES algorithm. This algorithm uh, smartly samples the solution space and obtains, uh, obtains parameters for which we can fit to the complete shape nicely. Well, this is for the complete shape, but we still haven't answered our question. How do we complete a partial shape? How do we transfer structure to the partial shape or perform, uh, obtain semantic meaning for this partial shape? To this effect, we built a cluster prediction network. So this network takes in as input a partial scan and predicts a template and a corresponding parameter initialization for the partial scan. Because the template has meta grammar, this automatically tra transfers semantic information to the partial scan. And given the parameter initialization, you can use that to fit the, uh, fit the template to the actual partial scan. In this particular example, you can see that the partial scan contains three legs and misses a fourth leg. But because our template consists of a four, it's a four-legged chair template, and therefore shares parameters. The four, the parameters of the fourth leg are learned from the other three legs. So once you fit the template to the partial scan, you retrieve the closest shape from the database and deform it to fit the actual input partial scan. So here you have a set of real scans in the first row. These scans have been scanned from IKEA. The second row consists of templates which have been predicted by the cluster prediction network and then fit to the partial scan. The third row consists of shapes which have been retrieved from the database and fit to the and deformed to fit the partial scan. We also use this technique to perform an initial shape segmentation uh, <laughs> for the purpose of label propagation. You can see over here that the first row consists of various example templates. The second and third row consists of shapes to which semantic information has been transferred from the templates. We also use this technique to perform scene completion. So there is this work called FlustumNet that takes in as input RGBD scans and proposes the location of various objects in the RGBD 3D, in the 3D point cloud. So over here it predicts that there is a partial sofa over there and there is a partial table over here. What we do is we pass these partial objects into our completion pipeline and we predict um, shape completion from, from the objects in our database, thereby completing the scene in a clutter-free manner. We also compare our technique to current reconstruction techniques. Uh, one such example example is Sung et al, where they produce boxes as output. Our boxes are more structured than the boxes uh, by Sung et al because of the reason that we have uh, structure embedded into our meta grammar. We also uh, compare our completion to Dai et al. Dai et al hallucinates the rest of the shape while we actually use shapes from the database and deform them. So we have a more clean completion than Dai et al. Summarize our contributions in this work. We propose uh, structure of our shape templates which are equipped with meta information. This meta information is useful to transfer structure from complete templates to partial scans. Here we use a retrieval and deformation based shape completion pipeline which completes these partial, sh partial shapes and is also useful to complete scenes and perform label propagation in shape synthesis. <coughs> the limitations of this work are that we use handcrafted templates. And the fact that we use handcrafted templates means to obtain all variations in a given database of shapes, we need to actually go through the entire database. So this would be helpful if we could learn these templates by means of a grammar inference block directly. Another, another main uh, limitation is that we have restrictive conditions here such as axis alignment or no rotational degrees of freedom. Ideally we'd like to have, uh, we'd like to be a method which is free of all this preconditioning. So the shape completion we spoke about in this technique um, is something which is a retrieval and deformation based setup. But more classical shape completion is done by means of surface reconstruction. So in the final work of the thesis, I shall speak about a technique where we attempt to perform surface reconstruction in a topology structure aware manner. Topo topology traditionally exists in absolute terms and is a highly non-continuous function of the shape. Topology gives us combinatorial information about a shape, just as how geometry gives us continuous information about the shape. Now, this is a very important problem to solve because of the reason that this is something that appears in nature all the time. If you have um, say, especially in the case of say, human organs. Human organs, because of the way they have been formed, are always of the same topology. 
be it belonging to a small baby or an old man. The same thing could be said of the human face. There are works that attempt to perform topology-aware surface reconstruction, uh, but most of them are ad hoc techniques and do not really give any topological guarantee. By topological guarantee, I mean if I say I want one hole, um, there is no guarantee that I would actually just get one hole in these reconstruction techniques. Most classical surface reconstruction techniques uh, do this by implicit function representation of the surface. So what they do is, given a point cloud, they provide a function on all of space from which you can extract the surface out and, complete, uh, and, and, that, and thereby provide a reconstruction of the entire surface. The drawbacks with existing works are that most works do not bother themselves with actually having the right topology and even those that do are ad hoc techniques with no topological guarantee. Also, they lack an ability to work around topological noise or topological ambiguities and shapes. So in this work, we provide a topology aware surface reconstruction technique which gives topological guarantee. We do this by means of a continuous handle on this difficult combinatorial optimization problem using ideas from this field of study called persistent homology. And finally, we shall complete real scans such as furniture and medical scans. So given a point cloud such as this, how does one complete such a point cloud? How does one have an implicit function representation for a point cloud? One thing we can do is just throw Gaussians around each of these points. But Gaussians are inherently dependent on their variance or covariance. So let's just assume that we have um, equal covariance on all the Gaussians on all of these points. If we throw these Gaussians around each of these points for a very small covariance, uh, very small variance, you, you see that these are a number of disconnected components. When I slowly increase my variance, I see that a hole is born. This is basically the right topology uh, when, I, when I want to like, reconstruct the surface of this point cloud. As I keep increasing my variance, this hole dies and then this just explodes over all of space. So it is to be remembered over here that the implicit function representation is inherently dependent on certain coefficients, as in this case the covariance, covariance matrix. An important topological property that can be uh, read out of an implicit function representation is the persistence diagram. Now I shall not get into the nitty gritty details of the persistence diagram, but there are just two things I would want you to remember. The first thing, given a function such as this, the number of topological modes of the function are the number of points in the persistence diagram. Basically, this function has a single hole, the persistence diagram has one hole. The second thing to remember is that the closer a point is to the x equal to y line in the persistence diagram, the more irrelevant or the more noisy or the less persistent that point is. For example, you have a noisy annulus over here. This is basically just an annulus which has been generated by throwing some noise around this point cloud. So given this noisy annulus, there is one major hole. And this major hole is captured by a point which is very far away from the x equal to y line. But then there are a number of other noisy topological components which are captured by points which are close to the x equal to y. So how does one use this very obscure piece of mathematics to actually perform surface reconstruction? So what you can do is, now we already know that the implicit function representation is dependent on certain coefficients. And given the function, one can always generate the persistence diagram. Now because this is a continuous space, any changes made to this continuous space, this persistence diagram, can be made to reflect upon the implicit function representation, which can further be made to reflect upon the set of coefficients. Thereby, depending on the requisite topology, I can change the persistence diagram, thereby actually changing the surface. I should, I should showcase this by means of a simple example. So say I have a point cloud such as this. Now this has a very obvious single hole. But say there was some topological ambiguity, and which is why I don't see points over here. Maybe my scanning technology does not allow me to see points over there. Then I want to be able to extract holes from this topo from this point cloud however I want to. I want to have single hole, then I should be able to get a single hole. If I want two holes, then I should be able to get two holes. So how do I get a single hole? I first throw Gaussians around each of these points in the point cloud, and then I compute the persistence diagram. Now the persistence diagram here has two points. One is very far away from the x equal to y line, and one is very close to it. So what we can do is we can push this point which is close to the x equal to y line even more towards it thereby making it lesser and lesser persistent. Therefore, there is just one persistent component in this diagram. And this is showing up as just one hole. Also, you see that the further I push this point away from the diagonal, the more persistent my hole becomes. This is seen by the fact that the value actually keeps increasing over here. Now, in the case of having two holes instead of one hole, what would I do? <coughs> yeah, I push it away from the diagonal. So, as I push the point away from the diagonal, I have a hole showing up. So basically there are two points which are further away from the diagonal and therefore I have two holes topologically over here. So 
So we can reconstruct the shape however we like, with one home or two homes. So we do the same thing on 3D shapes and uh, we perform reconstruction on a number of input point clouds. We see that the reconstructions we, propo uh, we provide are edgy, but they have the correct topology, while the reconstructions by the classical Poisson reconstruction technique um, are clean and smooth for manifold shapes, but fail in the case of real and pointed shapes, real world pointed shapes. We also use this to perform surface extraction on synthetic human organs, such as the heart. This is a particularly difficult example because there are four holes in the heart, and our technique manages to capture those four holes as indicated in red. Most other techniques don't even capture a single hole. We also use this to perform uh, scene completion on real scan or medical data, such as in the case of furniture over here, or the human brain over here. In the case of the human brain, this is even more important because of the fact that the human brain always has the same topology, it does not change. <coughs> To summarize the contributions in this work, we propose a topology-aware classical surface reconstruction technique with topological guarantee. Here we propose a continuous handle on combinatorial optimization using this idea of persistent homology. And finally, we complete real scans such as furniture or medical scans. In conclusion, we have tried to understand shape relationships through similarities in two different perspectives, geometry and structure. In the case of geometry, we try to solve the real-world application of shape matching by pioneering correspondences on non-isometric shapes and extending this in a modular and consistent manner to an entire collection of shapes. In the case of shape completion, we do this in two different ways. First, we try to do a retrieval-based shape completion technique where we use structure-aware shape templates to transfer structure from complete templates to partial scans. And we perform a reconstruction-based classical reconstruction technique where we transfer, uh, where we perform topology-aware surface reconstruction thereby completing topologically ambiguous shapes. So we have tried to attack a few important problems in the realm of shape inference. It would also be interesting to somehow push this towards more real world clean setups. An example of this is the topology of our reconstruction that we obtain is very edgy, while this is topologically correct. The Poisson surface reconstruction is typically smooth, especially for manifold like, sh manifold like surfaces, but it is not always topologically correct and this is something that can be fixed. So ideally, it would be good to come up with a technique which can which can mix both of these and come up with a, with a more aesthetically pleasing but topologically correct reconstruction. Another potential future direction is to perform shape inference based on another similarity perspective, which is common functionality. Now this can be done in the case of having an agent or not having an agent. In the case of having an agent, you would have an agent interact with a, with a set of shapes and based on how the agent interacts with these shapes, you would know which shapes have a common functionality. In the case of not having an agent, we might have to even define the notion of functionality by performing some sort of unsupervised learning. For example, you would probably want a cup and a tub to always have the same functionality because they can both hold liquids. These are a set of publications and preprints I've been, uh, I've been working as a part of during the course of my PhD. To conclude the technical section of my talk, I'd like to say that this is a problem that has been invoked, this problem of shape similarities, shape relationships, and understanding these relationships is something that's been in work for a long time. Two academic cultures, the Indian academic culture and the European academic culture, since 500 BC, people such as Pythagoras, Euclid, the Kerala school of calculus, down to the modern day, uh, down to even the medieval times, such as the Indian art form of Kolam or Da Vinci's Vitruvian man, have tried to use these informations of shape relationships to understand nature, symmetries, and, and other, other things that they show up in nature. Even today, these are very, very relevant problems, such as the industries of uh, shape matching is something which is very, very important in the industries of, say, autonomous vehicles or um, alternate reality, or even the biomedical industry, where uh, you have problems such as having to have proteins bind to drug targets. So these are very, very interesting and relevant problems, and I would invite many more researchers to explore this entire area. I'd like to thank a few people who have been, many people who have been um, extremely vital, crucial in my last five and a half years here at Stanford. I just take up a little bit more of your time for that, I'm really sorry. I'd like to start off by thanking the committee. I'd like uh, to thank Professor Bern Giraud uh, for almost immediately accepting to be part of my uh, committee. So I'd like to thank Professor Stefano Hermon and Professor Ken Salisbury. Uh, Professor Stefano Hermon, thank you so much for accepting to be uh, part of the committee. Uh, Professor Ken, thank you so much for chairing this committee. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Saki Weissman. Uh, like Professor Saki Weissman walked into the committee last week and I'm really, really thankful <laughs> uh, for, uh, for, for accepting to be in the committee at such short notice. I started my Stanford career rotating with Saki, so it's kind of poetic. It's like a, it's a complete circle that you're part of the committee. 
<laughs> I'd like to thank Professor Stephen Boyd. My final year at IIT Madras, I was doing this course on convex optimization. And I went to my professor and I told him that um, I really like this course, uh, give me something to read up. And he pointed me to Boyd and Van der Gens. And I've been a fan ever since. I applied to Stanford because you were here. And it's, um, I'm very, very thankful that you're part of this committee. Uh, and I'm, I feel very honored that you're part of this committee. Finally, Professor Leo Gibas, my academic parent, my advisor. There aren't enough words I can say to uh, express my gratitude to you. Uh, but I would like to say that I've learned so much from you, from observing you, apart from even interacting with you. There's, uh, there's so much one can learn from the group, from Leo, about how we can keep ourselves relevant after so many years of doing research. So thank you so much, uh, Professor. I'd like to thank all my collaborators. Uh, none of this would have been possible without any of you uh, and those who are not over here. But specifically, I'd like to thank three people, Zoran, Olga, and Boris. Uh, we are a huge lab, and we uh, spend a lot of times, uh, time with our postdocs. And these are three people who have handheld me uh, in my early years of my PhD, admonished me when things were not going right, uh, but have, have finally made sure that I'm here today. So thank you so much, Zoran. Boris and Olga are in Europe. Um, I'd like to thank my lab. These are among the smartest people I've ever interacted with. Um, I've had a lot of um, lot of fundamental discussions with so many of you. I mean, people are, all these people who I've not interacted with have in some way or the other contributed to my research in a very big way. Uh, so I'm very, thank you, I'm very thankful for you guys to have had me. Uh, and thanks for all the coffee. Uh, I belong to three departments somehow. I'm a doubly student working with a CS professor and we sit at Clark. So there are so many people who, are, who make our life uh, good, uh, who, who make our life run up, like our life runs because of so many people. So I really like to thank Rachel, Mio, Amy, and the entire WE admin and staff uh, for, for, put, for keeping me uh, up to date with what my progress requirements are and so on. I'd like to thank Heide and the entire team at Clark. Uh, they do a fantastic job of handling such a big building. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Carrie, Monica, Chris, and the other people at Gates. Uh, who have been um, our group admins for such a long time. I'd like to thank Stanford University. Uh, this, this was a dream. This was, uh, this was not something that I expected. Stanford, when I applied to various schools, was at the top of the list and was one of those tough schools which I, would, which I didn't think I would get into. Every day when I walk back from Clark to my dorm, I walk past the main quad, I look to the left and I see Palm Drive, I look to the right and I see Memorial Church, and I feel really, really thankful. Um, so I'm really thankful to Stanford. I understand that a certain amount of responsibility comes with being a Stanford researcher. I'd like to hope that I've imbibed that over the period of time I've been over here. I'd like to thank my alma mater, IIT Madras. I'd like to also thank my professor, Andrew Tangaraj. My first two years, he was my professor at uh, IIT Madras. Uh, my first two, three of years of research were with him. So thank you, Andrew. I'd also like to thank my school, PS Senior Secondary School, where I took baby steps towards, uh, towards interest in science and mathematics. Um, I'd also like to thank the couple of research internship opportunities that I've had, uh, Oculus Research and Autodesk. Uh, they gave me a break from research at Stanford and gave me a chance to get a whiff of industry and come back and pursue uh, what I do here with more vigor and more energy. I've been a part of many student organizations uh, as, my, as part of my time here at Stanford, uh, but the most important one I've been part of is Stanford India Association. Uh, I, I've, I'm honored to have led it in 2014-15, and I'm really thankful to the people over here who, uh, who became lifelong friends. Uh, I'd also like to uh, say that I kind of learned arts of uh, man management and resource management over here. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Hindu Students Association, which gave me direction to whatever I do. Um, these are an amazing set of people uh, who, who thrive on trying to make life a better place for every other person. So, Thank you so much. You guys are some of the best friends I've made in my life. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the Krishna Bharana Mandir and the Vedanta Society of Northern California for a given spiritual balance to my life. Thank you so much. Um, I play cricket for a team which is named after Stanford. It's called Stanford 11. So I'd really like to thank the entire team. Special shout out to Srinath Krishnan, my captain, and Rakesh Mishra who's recording the entire video today. This is, he's recording this using the team camera. So thank you so much. I'm also happy to say that even after I graduate from Stanford, I would be wearing the cardinal red. 
uh, when I play for Stanford. So at least where, you can. Where is your jersey here? Uh, I'm actually Viggy. I don't know. Viggy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's Viggy. Viggy. Viggy is me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can take me out of Stanford, but can't take the Stanford out of me. Uh, I'd like to thank my friends from IITM. Uh, they've been a huge source of support from before I came here, and I'll continue to be a source of support as, during my period of time over here. I'd really like to thank my friends who I made here at Stanford. You guys have been with me through my toughest times here at Stanford. The first one, one and a half years were really horrendous and I wouldn't have made it through without you all. So thank you so much. I'd like to thank my, uh, there are a few people who've worked with me on various uh, parts of my life. Uh, Karthik Ram Natarajan, he's been a friend for 16 years um, and he's been a huge, huge source of support and inspiration over the years. Shreyas and Prasad are two friends uh, we started our PhD dream together since grade 11. It was that's when we wanted to start doing a PhD. The other two have already finished their PhD, so I'm guessing I'm getting there, guys. <laughs> I'd like to thank my fiance Ajita for all the love and the support she's been giving me, um, and I'd like to thank my cousins Anand and Utpala for have made the US a second home to me. Finally, I'd like to thank my parents, my grandmother, and my brother uh, for have believed in me, for all the love they give me from all the way back in India. I'd like to finish by thanking, uh, I, by dedicating this uh, entire thesis to four people. There's an adage in Stan Sanskrit which goes as Mata Pita Guru Deva. I'd like to thank my mother. She's my biggest cheerleader, my biggest supporter, the one who sacrificed the most for me. Thank you, Ma. They say not all superheroes come in capes. Some of them come in bed sheets. So my father <laughs> is one such superhero. Uh, he's molded me the way I am today. So whatever I am today is because of him. Thank you, Dad. I'd like to thank my guru, uh, Professor Leo Gibas. Uh, I'd like, I like to mention a small anecdote over here. Last year I got into this very nasty accident and I went and told him that I had this and I was TAing for him that quarter. He went to the class and he told them that you guys are not disturbing Vignesh this week. If you have any questions, you come and ask me. So we, are, we students in our lab are protected and loved by him. Of course, there is the occasional uh, get this deadline. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the amount of love we receive um, there's, there's no words I can um, say to express my gratitude for that. Thank you so much, Professor. And finally, Devam, the uh, ultimate source, the ultimate sink, the one spiritual reality, Ganesha Krishna. Thank you. either like depending on the amount of denting again like if it's very very highly dented then probably it might not even recognize it but in the case it's probably slightly dented then it might give you a more similar shape from the database which probably is a smaller car or something Yeah. So I noticed like uh, at, the, at the last work you have uh, like uh, uh, oh, it's, it's something like you have a Gaussian function yeah. and then you finally reconstruct something. Yeah. So what is the, the, exactly the remeshing algorithm you are using? So we actually use like this uh, custom rem uh, remeshing algorithm. So what we do is we have like this function which is generated on all of shape mm -hmm. and then uh, actually I might need to go into the details of the persistent diagram. So basically we have like uh, a grid, an underlying grid on which this function has been reconstructed. So then we might have to get the surface from outside this grid in a topology aware manner. So I did not go into this uh, surface extraction details over the stock, but you would need to do that uh, making sure that the, um, the persistence diagram is not affected. So basically you add, um, how do I go, you add simplices basically, you, you add basically like uh, triangles and uh, cubes to your shape thereby not really changing the topology. The moment the topology is changed, then you do not add that as part of your surface reconstruction. I see. I'm thinking about the, like a like a Martian cube algorithm. Uh -huh. So if you set a threshold for a contour, yeah. uh, you can like reconstruct it uh, with a distance field, and maybe you can shrink it uh, to optimize each vertex, so it's like uh, increasing the intensity mm -hmm. from your Gaussian function. 
maybe that will make it the more smooth. So you're saying okay. you can like mix the reconstruction and the optimization itself. Yeah, yeah. So okay, because right now what we do is we do the optimization first and then we do the reconstruction from the optimized uh, algorithm, from the optimized function. I see. So I think it will definitely help. Probably we can, we can talk about this definitely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Among the three different projects that you showed us, four. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most difficult problem to solve? I think the most difficult problem, uh, but the one which took the least time, oh. was the fourth problem because the the seeds for the fourth problem were already like sown a long, long time ago. So when we were actually working on this uh, third problem, let me the templates problem, the one where yeah. you saw the fitting, we wanted to come up with an algorithm where we could even predict the templates directly. But the problem with that was this was kind of trying to mix combinatorial optimization and continuous optimization. And this was not something that was very easily doable. The continuous optimization part was still like something you could attempt, but not the combinatorial part. So the fourth problem was actually a problem where you end up doing some sort of combinatorial optimization, though it is done on a continuous space, so it's like you have a proxy over there. but. Uh, if you ask me, that is the hardest problem of the problems to solve, and it's probably the coolest as well. Uh, but it was not definitely the one which took the most time. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, then let's take the next one more time. Thank <laughs> you.